Uh, we are in a series that we are calling Summer Mixtape. We've been calling Summer Mixtape, and it's a series in which we have been uh, having conversations with uh, people at Meta Church, or some have been preaching, some have been Q&A, some have been group discussions, uh, sharing what they're learning about Jesus or what they've been learning in their relationship with God. And if uh, you're over the age of like, maybe let's call it like 35, I think is probably like the right threshold, then you remember as a kid or as a younger adult, um, like a cassette tape. And this was like pre-era of CDs and pre-Napster. Uh, and in the summer, what you would do is you would take these cassette tapes, you would pop them into a recorder, you would play your radio station that you wanted to listen to, you would wait for your favorite songs to come on, you would quickly press the record button, it would record the sound, and then you would stop the record button, wait for the next time you heard your favorite, a next song, and then you would create a summer mixtape in a very manual process, just like that. And there was different sounds of summer, different sounds that you would hear, that you would engage in, that you would listen to, that you would entertain. And in the same way here at Meta Church, what we've done is kind of taken this summer mixtape idea and allowed people, different people, normal people, regular people, people who don't have theology degrees or don't have like a ton of letters in front or after their names, I'm sharing the their faith experiences and what God has been doing and teaching them in their lives. And today we have an incredible privilege of being able to hear from someone who's been a part of our church for four years, but for the overwhelming majority of you, uh, you have not met her uh, and you've not been able to get to know her, the privilege of getting to know her. And the reason why is she's actually been a part of our church online community. And so shout out to our church online family. Uh, we have people literally all over the world who listen to our podcast. Uh, we have communities, uh, a community of people in South Carolina, uh, as well as Washington State. Uh, and today, I have the incredible honor of sitting down and having a conversation with someone who uh, has not just been a part of our church, but they've been an instrumental part of our church, of making a difference, of impacting the lives of people, of developing faith in others, and helping others pursue Jesus with greater intimacy, greater intentionality, and ultimately, greater faith. And so today, I want to invite all all of you to join me in welcoming to the front my dear friend Wanda Staggers. Let's give her a meta welcome as she makes her way up. So Wanda, you can have a seat. We'll pull this guy up front here. You can have a seat here. Let me grab my stuff. And then we're going to have a conversation because Wanda, uh, as I mentioned, has been a part of our church for four years or so, uh, making a difference, doing different things. But Wanda, I want to kind of... Um, We'll get to the Meta Church stuff, but um, you're here. You just celebrated your 70th birthday, and so I'm not like. Uh, she has two of her daughters, Nina and Alicia, hanging out over here. Shout out to them in the front over here. Um, so Wanda's originally from New York. It was born here, and then um, ended up postgraduate moving down to South Carolina. Um, I actually lived in South Carolina for two and a half years, but we never met or knew each other in the same town. Uh, didn't know each other. Um, same church, um, didn't know each other, weren't connected in that way. Um, but why don't we kind of maybe just take us back to, um, I'll preface it this way, you just turned 70, most of us are like 20. Um, and so, um, but take us back to kind of just the beginning, like when you came to faith in Jesus, when you first started uh, following Jesus, and uh, what was maybe the catalyst for that? Like, is that something that um, you grew up in, or was that something that you came to uh, as a decision or a decision point later in life? So um, I grew up on 145th Street between Amsterdam and Broadway. Um, I think that's where the Checkers is right now. <laughs> well, <laughs> it was deep Harlem then. <laughs> so, and, you know, life was hard. It was, I have three brothers, three older brothers. It was six of us in an apartment. Um, and I tell my children now, I mean, if I lived like my daughter lives in New York now, I probably would have stayed, but it was like no heat, no hot water. And we just didn't know what the next day was gonna bring. And so I attended Convent Avenue Baptist Church. That's the church I grew up in. Um, church was a part of my family. And yeah. so we went to church and then we could walk to church. So if your parents didn't go to church, it was fine. I was involved in all the youth stuff in my church. I knew Christ. I went to Sunday school. I remember my Sunday school teacher, Deacon Pearson, and how he shared the Bible with us. So I was a believer. Yeah. 
but then I went to college. So, okay. <laughs> and many I don't of think us, anyone can relate yeah, to that, everybody know? knows about then I went to college. Yeah. So I started my freshman year with my Bible, doing all the things I had been taught. But it looked like everybody else was having so much more fun. Um, it was the parties. It was everything. And I intentionally walked away from Christ. I just, like, don't bother me. Don't even make me feel guilty for what I'm doing. Just kind of go back over there because the party's over here. Right. And so that's what I did. And... So my friends graduated on the four-year plan. Okay. I was on the five-year plan. Thank God. I, <laughs> thank God. I, I, I got it. Everyone's on a five-year plan now, so you're a, you were kind of ahead of your time. That's, that's what it was. That's how you need to tell the story. So by the time I got, you know, the realization hit me that I was, my parents were spending money for college. They worked hard. My parents were factory workers. And it was like, this is not what they sent me here for. You know, I've gotten so off track of what I came here for. It broke my heart. And the only thing I can remember then was Deacon Pearson. I knew the 23rd song. I knew the Lord's Prayer. And I just went down in prayer in my apartment, and I asked God, save me. Amen. I'm in such a mess. I'm in such a mess. And he did. And my life started turning around, and I went into year five. I was a math major. So because of all the courses I had failed, my whole fifth year were math courses. So it was hard, but he brought me through. And I graduated that year. And um, I went to school in Hartford, Connecticut. I did not want to come back to New York City. There was nothing here for me. And my childhood, it was rough. And I'm like... I don't want to come back here. So I went to South Carolina. My parents are from South Carolina. They had immigrated here in the 40s when you didn't want to be in South yeah. South Carolina. And so I had family there. I went back there and then did graduate school. But my transition, uh, you know, I tell people in the Bible study, it was not overnight. Yeah. It's, it's been a long journey, yeah. 70 years. I'm still learning about God. I'm still trusting in him more. It was not, uh, I gave my life to Christ and tomorrow was so much better. Right. You know, no, yeah. but I knew that I could trust him yeah. and that trust has been growing. So that's kind of how I got where I am. Yep. Um, and I've j- I'm still working at it. Yeah. Man, I, I just want to say this to, to, to you, church. We're, again, we skew young. This is such a gift to have someone with this perspective and experience. And for many of us, if not the majority of us, the New York that we know and that we get to partake in and that we get to enjoy and we Instagram about or Snapchat about or, or, or create some, let me show you all of the coolest restaurants in New York City, TikTok. Mm-hmm. Like, there were others who didn't have that experience, and yet they came from that. And, and just to honor you, Wanda, I think to be able to speak to the fact, we, this conversation isn't necessarily about that, but as a young African-American woman, going to get, like, uh, furthering your education, graduating, then going to pursue, like, a degree, a postgraduate degree beyond that, uh, in a time when not only was that just stifled across as a whole for women, but particularly people of, of, of color, um, really is just a gift. Um, like, I'm... We got more to talk through, but I could just finish right there. And be like, that's a treasure for us because we don't have these experiences and we don't always get to hear from people with these experiences. So thank you for, for sharing that and speaking to that. Well, um, let me share something on that. Go for it. So I said I have three older brothers. So both of them, I was raised by both parents. But my dad, um, re- he said, the boys can work any kind of grunt job. He said, but I want you to get your education. I don't, because he came up through, my dad was born in 1921. He knew how many 
men treated women. He knew what women went through. He said he did not want me to be mistreated by any man, that he wanted me to be able to take care of myself. So that's why I know he sent me to school to get an education. He wanted me to marry, but he also wanted me to have my independence and not be stuck in a marriage where I wasn't treated well. Yeah, talk about being ahead of his time. So, uh, Man, what an incredible legacy to leave behind. Um, you, you kind of alluded to this a little bit in terms of like your faith journey, not necessarily being like, okay, I believe in Jesus and now everything's okay. Um, where have maybe some of the challenges lied as you followed Jesus? Um, but then also at the same time, how have you seen God's faithfulness in the midst of um, those ups and downs, highs, lows, kind of five steps forward, 10 steps back, you know, moments of life? Well, probably because as I continued through life, um, and things were difficult. I always thought I had a plan. You know, I'm going to do this. There was a point in time for several years raising my children. I worked seven days a week. I taught school during the week. I had a little flea market business on the weekend. You know, when school got out in the summer, I found places to teach. I, I was working all the time. Um, I should have, looking back on that, just depended on God. But I kept coming up with a plan and, and really like spinning my wheels in mud. Yeah. You know, you make money and then there were the bills over here. There was the debt. There was, it just seemed like you couldn't get your head above water. But God has been so good to me. And, and over the years, you know, I'd catch a break or whatever. But then when I really started trusting, and then we can get into tithing. That's, and I started tithing. And and I really just said, I'm at my wits end. I'm giving it to you. That's when things started getting better. And I didn't wholeheartedly trust in him. Still, when stuff got rough, I was trying to come up with a plan. But, you know, now I go, it's going to be okay. I just know whatever's going on, it's going to be okay. I speak to God about it. I speak to God all day long about the big things and the very little things. It could be I've got a full day schedule, lots of things, and I'm wondering, how am I going to fit that in? How am I going to get there by this time? But I can just say, God's got this. He'll work it out. So something may finish earlier than I thought, and I have plenty of time to get to the next appointment. So it doesn't matter how big or how little. Yeah. He's got you. Yeah. But it takes it takes letting go of your own control and trusting him to have it. And that's hard because we think we can do, we've been doing it, you know? And I think for me as a parent raising my kids and all kind of things, I thought I had it or at least that I needed to have it. But man, it is so nice now to just say, okay, God, this is what my day looks like. Yep. This is what's going on. I'm asking you to take control. Just show me at each moment, what is my next step? Yeah. What is the next thing I should do? And then when we get that done, show me the next thing. Yeah. And it works. Yeah. It works. I, I love that. It's so good. And, and the simplicity of it, you know, People will often go to God in desperate times. So I need a big breakthrough. I need a miracle of some kind. Something major just happened. And we should. Um, but then it's, e it's so much easier to neglect God in the small things and think, well, maybe he just doesn't care or he's not interested. Um, and, uh, or he's got busier or bigger things to deal with rather than that. Uh, and yet I love um, how the writer of Hebrews says that we can come to the throne of God boldly. In fact, that God is desiring of us to come. And, and oftentimes when we gather for prayer as a church, I share that. It's like we, we need to eliminate language that qualifies or minimizes uh, our burdens or our requests before God because God is not, you know, hey, leave me alone. I'm too mm -hmm. busy. Um, he's welcoming us into his presence, inviting us into it. And I love that your experience over the, over the course of decades has been in the small things and the big things, I can go to him. I can trust him in these things. And even as I'm kind of in this evolving journey of learning to trust, still meeting and finding God in those spaces, um, that's, that's encouraging for me um, because it means that 
my path thus far um, doesn't have to be limited to what I see behind me, but I can look ahead and say, well, others have experienced. Think of this scripture, just so I'll say this and I'll shut up. Um, but David um, wrote in Psalms and he says, I've been young and I've been old, but I've never seen the faithful Lord abandoned. Um, That's right. And, and I love that you're able to bring that experience and perspective um, to us. You, you spoken a little bit about this, but um, I've, you know, shared with our church and, and I've, you know, shared with you, um, to you specifically, but I grew up in a single parent household. My mom raising three kids, um, not earning a lot of money, not earning a lot of income. You've raised four daughters, um, as I mentioned, two of whom are, are here. Uh, and uh, I know you have a, a deep connection with each of your daughters and, and, and love them and care for them. And um, they all came to celebrate your party, so I think that means they, they care about you too. Uh, and they love you deeply uh, as well. Um, but do you mind maybe just sharing some, um, some of that, speaking a little bit to that experience? Because I have an incredible admiration for women like you, women like my mom, who, you know, are just trying to do the best they can and sort through something. Parenting, you know, I have one daughter, I'm married, and just the two of us trying to navigate that can be challenging. Um, and so with multiple children, as in a single mom, um, maybe just speak to that a little bit of what that experience was like, uh, some highs, some lows, um, and any kind of nuggets of wisdom that you would like to impart for any of the parents listening or watching. The nuggets of wisdom is, it's going to be okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Write that down. It's going to be okay. <laughs> Keep reciting this to myself on a daily basis. I think at one point, all four of my girls were maybe in their teens, somewhere in there, okay. two driving. <laughs> and whatever story they told, all four of them told the same story. <laughs> So you have to separate them and get the youngest one and get her in a room by herself. <laughs> if you really wanted the truth. <laughs> but um, it was fun. It, it was fun. It was hard. Um, but we made it. You know, um, I was working all the time. Now, my parents had retired and moved back from New York to the South. So my mom and dad were there, and they were always a great help yeah. to me. Um, we, what, we lived in the country, and we still live in the country. It's just that the country is developing. All the Northerners are coming South. And so now it's almost like we lived in the city. So they grew up walking from house to house. They could go over to my parents or whatever. So I, I had a lot of guilt. And I'm sure a lot of single parents do, that you're working all the time and you're not a part of your children's life. and. Um, I should be home with them more. We should travel more. I should give them these experiences. But they're grown women now, and they're all professional women. And it's really cool that they can call me and we talk about professional things because they know I've been in the workforce, you know. It's mom, would you read over this email or read over this? Give me your opinion. So the five of us, my four daughters and I, we have a chat. We share stuff. We ask each other for professional opinions. And so back in the day when other mothers, especially in the South, were soccer moms, you know, that's a lot down there. And I thought that you know, I'm not with my children, but now I have a gift that I can share with them that kind of some of the soccer moms don't have the professionalism to share. But, you know, my girls have made me feel really good by saying, you know, we have no regrets. It was good. We had opportunities. And so then when all the other families were vacationing in Disney, we had no money. We were not vacationing anywhere. Our, our vacation at Disney was the Disney store or like driving by Disney parks. Like there's Disney kids and that was, that was it. Well, when they were very little, I took them to the country fair and told them they were at Six Flags. <laughs> <laughs> the rides all looked the same. They didn't know the difference. <laughs> But um, now, you know, that they are grown and I'm retired. Well, you know about retirement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
um, I can we can do vacations. So yeah. we try to get together and we do vacations. Yeah. I can talk to them, and that's four of them. Yeah. I can talk to one of them for two hours. Yeah. So by the time you talk to four of them, it's an eight hour day job. <laughs> so we talk every day, yeah. all day. We're talking to one another and it's the best thing ever. We're really close. And one of my goals as I age is I want them to be close to one another. I'm not gonna be here always. Yeah. And I know when my parents passed away, my brothers and I, we have to be intentional about staying connected because my parents were the anchor. We would meet at my parents' house, I'd see my brothers and stuff, but now that we don't go to my parents' house, I have to call my brother. So my oldest brother, who's 76, he turned that last week, he comes to my house every Sunday to visit me, and we talk. I want my daughters to be connected yes. like that for the rest of their lives. Your best friend is your sibling. Mm -hmm. Your best friend is your family. You should be connected to your parents. You should be connected to your family. And that's what I want for them. And I have to be intentional about setting up that scenario where you don't call me to tell me to tell so-and-so. You call them and have that conversation. Now, the way that they pulled off that Friday night surprise <laughs> party, they're evidently well connected with one another because I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. L listen, this was a party. Uh, shout out to sisters because my family... They plan stuff, they just don't communicate about it. Um, but this was like a party, 70 some people, all like different parts of the country flying up to celebrate Wanda, to have her birthday. We show up at this restaurant, it is like over the top, just like precisely planned college friends, family members, church friends, you know, just uh, tremendous, in incredibly executed, you know, chef's kiss to you guys. Uh, it was uh, amazing, amazingly well done. I know you're, you're going to be maybe quite humble about this, but if you look back, you know, particularly through like adolescence or when the girls were young, um, what was maybe like um, something that you felt like, okay, this is something that I did well um, as a mom or as a parent, and in the moment, maybe you didn't even realize you were doing it well, but then looking back, you see like God's grace, like, oh, this was God's grace upon me and helping me see this or discern this. And I think even just kind of what you just spoke to about having them be connected is, is an aspect or an, or an example of that. But are there, is there something else or another couple of things maybe you look back and you realize like, oh, well, I didn't realize that I was doing that, but I re now years later realize that, was, that paid massive dividends? I think um, communication. Mm -hmm. So when I was growing up, I could talk to my mom about anything. I'm sure I shocked her many a times, but she kept a straight face and she would let me talk. And that was so important to me. So the one thing I would say is talk with your children rather than preach to your children. Hear them so that they will come to you with anything. And I have to wash out the shocked face too, you know. And sometimes they say to me, Mom, I don't want your advice. I just want you to listen. And so sometimes we just have to listen. And so I try not to ever say, this is what I think you should do, but I'll say, well, you know, I had that experience before too, and this is how it turned out for me. Not to say it's gonna turn out for you that way, but when you listen or they say things like, this is what the other kids are doing at school, well, how do they know so well what the other kids are doing at school? So as much as you can listen to your children or things like to me, don't try to control them with, well, I won't give you this, or if you don't go here or do what I say, you won't get this money or this allowance. Why put your kids in at a burden or people who, you can't live here unless you're gonna live under my rules. I get it, 
but I'm not putting my child out because now you've broken the opportunity to help them get better. Whatever is going on in their life, if you disconnect and think that, oh, they're going to change that habit because you disconnected and they're going to come home okay, you're going to lose them. And if you're here in the city, I could not imagine losing my child in the city where you never saw them again. So I had to swallow a lot in raising them and some of the things that they got involved in or friends or whatever, but my door was always open. You had a place to sleep, you had a place to eat. You know, and we're going to work through this together. I know this can get better. And those were times when I prayed the hardest. Yeah. And I was telling them, you need to pray. God brought me out of the things that I had gotten messed up in. He can bring you out too. So I just say, don't ever stop talking to your children. That's not going to make them come around. That's pride in you to think they love you that much. Wow. You know? Write that down. <laughs> you need to stay connected with them. That's the only way you're going to help them and guide them and lead them back to where they need to be. Man, that's so good. It, it reminded me of two stories, um, both um, revelations of who God is. Uh, the first is one that's familiar to a lot of people, Luke chapter 15, the story of the prodigal son. And um, the son walked away, but the father welcomed him back, ran to meet him on his return home. And so that son always knew I could go back to my father's home. I could go back to my father's place. And he even thought to himself, if I go back, even the servants and the slaves are treated better than what I'm living right now. And my dad wouldn't put me below them. Um, and, and so, you know, you're a living example of that. But, but that story actually, I think, um, is only further, Jesus spoke that um, parable as, as an example to illustrate who God is. But I think it, it only further reveals um, and amplifies who God was from the very beginning. Um, Genesis is the first book of, of the Bible, Genesis chapter 3. So three chapters into the story, the narrative of, of human history and the human story. Um, there's a couple that God created, Adam and Eve, and they fall into sin. Uh, and it says prior to that moment that they, had, um, they were completely known by God and they walked in the garden with God and had fellowship with God. And then when they sinned, that fellowship was broken and they went into hiding because they were ashamed of, of what they'd done, ashamed of where they were at. And God sought them, and he called out and said, where are you? He asked two questions. Where are you, and who told you you were naked? Now, interesting, I believe in a God that knows everything, so I think God knew the answers to both of those questions. So his questions weren't you know, condemning or um, uh, to, to bash them. What he was, when he asked, this is something God reveals to me, he's like, when he asked, where are you? What he's saying is, why are you letting something get between us? Nothing has ever been between us. Nothing has ever stood in the way of who I am and who, what we have. And so you're allowing something to kind of divide us. And he said, who told you you were naked? He said, who put that shame on you? Because it didn't come from me. And, and in fact, God then condemns the serpent. And that's where the first judgment comes against. And, and I think you are a living example of that in both those stories and both those narratives of seeking to do that with your children and with your daughters, to, to pursue relationships, to, to engage in communication, to, in a sense, say, okay, I can't deal with what I do this the way I want to do this or say this the way I want to say this, but, but I need preserving the relationship more than, like you said, preserving your pride um, or, or your ego. And, um, and it's just really, really good. I, I only have two bits of parenting advice. The rest is theory, but one of them is similar. It's just like parent with the first name in mind, not the last name. Um, that that child is an individual. And I might think, well, you're an Ortiz. You should look this way, do this thing. And actually, that's Gia. And who is Gia? What does Gia need from me as a father? Who do I need to be rather than letting my last name or, or my thoughts get in the way of the relationship that God has provided and, and um, afforded me the opportunity to have with her? So that's really, really good. Well, if we remember when we were teenagers, um, whatever our friends said seemed to be far more important than what our parents said. So when they're going through that period, you know, you can say everything, but they think their friends are the best thing ever. And we tend to parent the way we were parent, parented. And so you have to think, would your parents 
home be open to you after you messed up? Could you go back home? And if you could go back, then you need to welcome your child back because we all are going to make mistakes. They're going to make mistakes. If the door was not open for you to come back, you can change that with your child. You don't have to be who your parents were. If your parent put you out and did not let you come back because you screwed up, don't be that parent. Open the door to your child. That's good, that's really good. Let's fast forward maybe to uh, more recently, these last, um, uh, I guess we probably got connected to each other about four years ago, um, mm -hmm. uh, summer of 2020, maybe early fall of 2020. Um, how did you, you were living in South Carolina, we were here, obviously COVID was happening. Um, how did you come to find out about MetaChurch and then what interested you, because I have my perspective when you reached mm -hmm. out, um, but what kind of intrigued you or interested you and um, what was happening at MetaChurch and, and desiring to be a part of it in some form or capacity? Well, um, I had said to you back then, now I'm not a church hopper, okay? So to change churches was a big deal for me, but it was 2020, we were going through COVID, we were going through so much in the nation. And Connor in the lower states, if you kind of know how it is, there, um, it can be divided. But I was in a church that was not divided through time, but 2020 became even diversive there. And so I was like, I can't do this. You know, I, I, this is, this is not what, who I think Christ is. What is being said on Facebook? What is being said through communities? Things that people are staking in their yards and saying are so cruel and so mean to groups of people. I'm like, I can't, I'm not going to be part of this. But there was kind of nowhere to go there. Um, and I'd grown up here in extreme. I mean, people don't even ask what you are here because there's so many different people here. And that's, the, that's what God wanted. When he went to the Gentiles, he wanted everybody to follow Christ, regardless of who you were or what your background was. So that's what I was seeking. I didn't know at the time it was at Meta, but that's what I was seeking. And so I was online. Every church was online, and I was on Facebook, and a friend of mine from my other church said, oh, I'm involved in a church planting. She and I had served together, so I wrote through Messenger, and I'm like, really, where are you now? And so she said, Meta. And I was like, oh, okay, hook me up. And so <laughs> she did, and then she went a different way. Um, but Ricky came down, Ricky and Krista came to Greenville and I met y'all in Greenville. Um, he had called me, he began to tell me more about the church. And because everything was online, you were doing small groups then. So we had small groups, Sebastian, shout out to Sebastian. I haven't got to meet him. I want to meet you face to face. <laughs> I remember Sebastian was in my group and we had a great small group and I had so much fun. I felt so connected to be in the Zoom call and see so many different faces. I was like, yeah, this is where I need to be. And then as he talked, y'all talked about things to do in the community like the backpacks. That was me as a kid. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I need to support that. This is what I want to do. I know growing up in Harlem, I, I started working at 14, and I was working for this little place called um, Helping Hands, and it helped the community. And when I got ready to go to college, the office took one of the typewriters, nobody uses typewriters now, but took an electric typewriter, just packed it up, put it in a box, and was like, here, I know you're gonna need this in college, take this with you. You know, there were just people at Convent Avenue, Girl Scout leaders, this person. I mean, all of us were poor. You know, we were all poor, but they were like, 
you're going to college, take this, take that. So I knew in college that I had people back home who were rooting for me, who intended for me to succeed. I was a smart child. I just didn't have the resources that everybody had. So that's why towards the end, year five, I had to turn that around. I had people who were my support system. And all of you can be the support system for somebody. You know, be the encourager. And if nothing else, you're texting them and they know there are people who are depending on me to succeed. I'm not going to mess this up. Yeah. I love that. And so I, I just remember when uh, we connected and there was a lot of synergy but then at the same time i was also you know i don't part like i guess native new yorker like suspicious um like what like uh hey, is this legit like you know what's what's the deal here and um but it's been so amazing um and so fruitful because you've been involved in um certainly like in giving and supporting different causes and 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 investing in those things but you've also led um, online bible studies and groups uh that dozens of our people have been a part of um helping people read the scriptures on a daily basis and and it's been so fruitful and so impactful and and i you know look at a crowd like this and 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 realize that um, there are names of people that have been um, impacted for eternity because of the way that you've served and not allowed a geographic boundary uh, to be a limiter or a prohibitor from what God wants to do and how God wants to use you. Um, similarly, uh, you were semi-retired at the time, um, and um, but trying to kind of ease your way and coast your way into retirement. And uh, one day you reached out to me and, and said, hey, can we talk about this? And um, we were talking through our, our Meta's DNA, and one of our DNA here at Meta Church is that we say we're tenacious. And what we mean by that is that we don't just have the grit to hold on. So much of New York City is just about, like, just hang on and make it till the end. But to be tenacious, what you say is that we're committed to taking ground and advancing the kingdom of God. And so you were saying, you, you reached out and said, you know, I, I, I don't think I'm supposed to retire yet. Like, I have <laughs> more in me, and God's really challenging me on this tenacious DNA that I have more to give and I have more opportunity uh, to make an impact. And so it was really a, a massive, it was a step of faith, but maybe even more so a surrendering of, of a desire and a longing, something that you've earned um, to, to continue and, and you're back in education and, and, and doing work. Can you maybe um, just touch on that a little bit in terms of maybe specifically of looking at your place in life um, and then recognizing, no, there's still God, there's still more that God can do through me and with me. So um, 2016, maybe I retired. I was the 62, you know, oh, retired. I had my years in. But what I continued to do was after school programs for kids, specifically for girls and uh, m minority girls, STEM programs. My background, I told you, was in mathematics, mathematics, computer science, and engineering. And so um, I just stayed busy with that, um, that busy with that is taking me all the way back to the classroom again. So, so I never stopped, but I was also reading my Bible. I had done the trip to Israel and absolutely loved it. It was incredible, but it brought to my attention how little I knew about the Bible. I'd never read it cover to cover. So here I am in Israel learning all this stuff, and they were just like little separate stories. Like, I could not have told you whether David was back in Genesis with Noah, with Adam, and I didn't know the timeline. And so anyway, when I got back, I decided I'm going to read the Bible. So I did. I read the Bible, and it was good. <laughs> it was good. But now I need someone to talk to it about. It's like you saw a movie. And so you and I talked and I said, I'm going to read the Bible again. But I need somebody to talk to, you know. And so then that was the birth kind of, of that. And then a number of people came on in here on the Zoom call. And we did the Bible in a year. And I'm not teaching. So everybody know I'm not teaching. 
It, I was facilitating the discussion, and man, did we have some good discussions. Um, and know that it's not recorded, so you can be vulnerable. We get on, we talk to one another, and we learn together. Um, and then we went on the next year to do the Book of Acts. This year, we're, we're about to wrap up in October the Book of Romans. And then in the new year, 2025, We'll talk and we'll start another Bible study. So please join us. It's just relaxed. You can log on at 7 o'clock on Zoom and we just talk to one another, share stuff. There's someone from Washington State. There's someone from Canada. There's another lady from South Carolina who are all regulars. And then also some of Asia's in it, some of the people who are in here. But it's great to read the word and then have someone to discuss it with. And then you hear that we're coming from different perspectives. This is what I saw in this word when I read it, and someone else would say, well, I think it's this. But to hear it all, I mean, you don't forget it then. It's like someone telling you a story, and when you hear the discussion, you don't forget what you read. And that, I would not give that up for the world. For me, that is my connection to you all. That is what keeps me at Meta. It makes me feel like I'm part of this church. Because I watch you online, I watch the message on Sunday, but it is the Zoom call and the conversation that we are friends that keeps me connected. Is, is something you shared with us in February when we were together. Um, you you mentioned just about how encouraged you are by seeing so many young people oh, showing yeah. up to church, getting connected, going to group, and doing these different things. And um, and I know for me, I was a part of the the Bible in a Year group that you uh, led, and and the impact and and how encouraging it was. Because I was quite discouraged at that time, given church kind of having to rebound and start all over. And for me, that was like a weekly highlight. Um, that was something that was emotionally and spiritually uh, a pick me up. Um, and, and so I've benefited from, I know others have benefited from um, your ministry and the things that you've done. And I'm so grateful um, to God and to you for your obedience and your willingness to say, okay, God, if you say I've got more to give, then I'll give it. Um, rather than just kind of cashing in the check and saying, I've done my time, I've put in my part. Um, so, so thank you and, and honor to you for that. Um, this last thing is not really a question, um, but um, we had some people who uh, were excited about you being here and, and really wanted to uh, just make your time meaningful. Uh, and so we, we wrote a card, but they've also provided a very generous gift um, uh, for you to enjoy a, a New York priced dinner uh, <laughs> with, um, uh, with your daughters. And so uh, I want to slide this card to you. You can look Thank at this later, you. but you can enjoy. Can we give Thank Wanda you. a hand um, and just honor can her? Can I say one other thing? Absolutely you can. Absolutely you can. So... When I'm on the Zoom call and I see all these young, beautiful faces, I think about my daughters. Some of them are younger than my daughters. And so when I'm talking with them, I'm telling them things that I would tell my daughters. And I'm so just proud to see so many young faces in here. And my thought is, don't waste your walk with God. Don't wait till you're 50 or 60 to walk with him. You have so many years to trust in him now, to walk with him now, to experience the joy, the peace, the grace, the mercy, every, every gift that God has to give you. So don't waste your years thinking about tomorrow. Do it now. That's what I would want. That's what I would want for my own children. Give your life to Christ now. You can trust him. You know, everything doesn't seem to be perfect. Trust him. Just because it didn't work out for you today, maybe what didn't work out for you was a blessing for somebody else and your day is coming. But just don't waste your time. That is my advice to every one of you. Amen. Amen. Well, mm -hmm. give a round of applause. I want to pray for you. Thank um, you. And so if you would, I'll ask, um, I'll ask everyone to bow your heads, close your eyes as I pray for Wanda. Um, Father, we thank you.
um, for this woman. Lord, we thank you, God, for the way you've used her. God, we thank you for uh, the grace that you've placed upon her life. Father, I pray in this next year that it would be as fruitful, if not more fruitful, than any year that she's lived before. God, that in her education, in the classroom, Lord, that she would have a greater impact beyond the X's and O's, uh, the fractions or the problems or or the uh, textbooks or the curriculum, Lord, that her impact would be transformational in the lives of the students that she has the privilege and the honor of investing in and sowing into. Lord, I pray that her relationship with her daughters would grow and blossom and be even more fruitful this year than it's been in years past. Lord, I pray that her kingdom impact would stretch beyond a Zoom call and reach into eternity, Lord God. Father, I thank you for the gift that she's been to our church and to our community and to our people. I thank you, Lord, that you've used her in a mighty way these last four years, and I'm expectant and fully ready to receive what you have through her and for her in the years to come. God, we thank you that you've appointed and allowed for her to be here this weekend in person, to worship with us, to gather, to see and meet people for the first time. Lord, may you bless her. May you honor her, Lord, as she seeks to follow you and honor you with her faith and with her life. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.